Um, he is the Rapporteur on Adequate Housing at the UN um, as a component of the right to adequate standard of living and on the right to non-discrimination non in this context. Um, he took up his mandate in May of, of this year. Um, he's a professor of law and development at the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. Um, and he's the founder of the Displacement Research and Action Network at MIT also. He's conducted, um, done over 20 years of research on social movements and human rights advocacy around the world, focusing in particular on land and property rights, evictions and displacement. And he has published numerous books and scholarly articles, including research on uh, evictions, displacement, human rights and housing. He's gonna talk to us today for about 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll um, go off and we'll talk a little bit more about what we uh, did in our breakout session. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, really appreciate you being here today. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and thank you, uh, Chamtoli, uh, and to the Law of the Margins um, and to the various community and grassroots media organizations and uh, the housing rights advocates um, and organizers here. Uh, housing as a human right, of course, is a uh, difficult topic to discuss in the United States. Uh, from purely an international level, the United States, uh, in terms of its foreign policy, has never accepted housing as a human right and has refused to sign international treaties that guarantee housing as a human right for its own citizens. Uh, it has a long history of rejecting all economic, social, and cultural rights, precisely the rights that matter for the poor and the marginalized. Um, housing, of course, is a central part of them. Uh, I would say that that's actually the central challenge in front of the organizers. Uh, at a, in, a, in a country, given its past and its history and its culture, of the rejection of the rights that belong to the most marginalized as being equally important. How do you actually convince the rest of the country to go along with recognizing the importance of something like housing as a human right? Precisely the same challenge that was faced by those who have tried to push for healthcare as a human right. Every time an argument was made in the last 15 years, we have heard louder and louder in this country that you know healthcare is not a commodity, it's a human right. We have heard it over and over again. Um, it's been accepted by a vast number of people. Uh, so country is changing, but it is also still controversial and rejected by a lot of other people. And if healthcare is at that level, housing is not that far behind. Even fewer people accept housing as a human right at this point, despite the heroic advocacy of groups like yours and many others who have been advocating for housing as a human right for decades. Uh, but they've always been, as the title of your group says, uh, they've been at the margins. Uh, but they are very important voices at the margins. And these are the voices that push for real change in the United States. And I think that that's actually a central dilemma, that the rejection of uh, something like housing as a human right comes from a misunderstanding of US exceptionalism and US supremacy, which is a root cause of the racism and white supremacy that led to the death of George Floyd and uh, so many people of color. So involves the rejection of both, essentially. Um, and the importance of mobilization and movements for pushing housing as a human right cannot be overstated in this context. Uh, housing will emerge and is emerging as a human right, as a sociological phenomenon, as a political phenomenon. But it's not going to happen because elites agree to it or because people at the halls of Congress suddenly decide to write a law. Uh, it's going to come from the same way that big changes have happened in this country through mobilization and grassroots activism. And that's exactly uh, what I want to say that this movement and this particular meeting that you're holding is very important. Now, of course, we all know why right to recognizing right to housing and with so many other rights recognized in Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that are essential for a decent standard of living for everyone in the world is so important. 
healthcare or social security, protection from destitution in old age, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is the constitutional and political importance, uh, but also a cultural transformation in the way in which we prioritize things in society and you know, in the decisions that we make. And also in the way in which we teach about things and the way in which we build, we do knowledge building. And that's been very important for me as an academic. Uh, what sort of things we uh, see students prioritizing as valid knowledge as opposed to other forms of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's, uh, housing as a human right is also terribly important, of course, because there is a, there is a massive global uh, housing crisis and has been one for the last several decades, but which has worsened progressively over time, as we have seen with the rise in uh, uh, the number of evictions and homelessness. And we have seen with the rise of speculation and landlessness uh, and uh, the rise in corporate uh, ownership of uh, property uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, at the moment of uh, this this crisis, coronavirus hit. It's a, it was a terrible time. Uh, housing was already in crisis. There was already a pandemic before the pandemic actually broke out. And and I'm talking about the question of you know evictions, for example, as a pandemic. It was a pandemic of evictions. And um, and uh, when the coronavirus hit, it was obvious that it was going to have a huge impact on uh, uh, many sectors, uh, but particularly on housing, because uh, uh, the responses that governments have designed to respond to the coronavirus have been essentially that people should stay at home uh, under lockdown orders. And so home has emerged as the sort of the front line in the defense against uh, the virus. Uh, so the question of a right to a home is more important than ever, if anything, before the coronavirus actually, you know, uh, hit us. Uh, everyone needs a home, and unfortunate reality is that many people don't have a home, or if they have a home, they are not safe homes, or they are not adequate. The question of safety and adequacy are central to my mandate, uh, and there is a continuous assessment of what, what, what they are. Um, so it is because of that and because of uh, the, the importance of the, the, the question of home and housing to COVID-19 that I decided to uh, uh, focus my first report as a UN Rapporteur, uh, which is actually to the UN General Assembly. Uh, the report uh, has been written and the report is gonna focus on COVID-19 and its impact and relationship with right to adequate housing. Mm -hmm. uh, homelessness, of course, is a big part of it. And we put out a call. I, I, I basically put out a call for submissions and sharing of uh, information from uh, states, from local governments, from uh, civil society organizations, from UN agencies and others, uh, from expert bodies. Uh, and I'm happy to say that uh, we received uh, an unprecedented number of submissions. Uh, over 200 submissions were received. Although the time given was only three weeks, it was astonishing and I'm very grateful for all the submissions that were received. Uh, and based on those submissions and based on, uh, of course, my own analysis, uh, this report has been uh, prepared. And uh, what I can tell you right now, I know that the focus of this conversation is um, on many issues, but on homelessness as well. And I uh, would like to say that homelessness, as uh, uh, discussed in the report, um, uh, has two sides to it. On the one hand, uh, there is a tremendous uh, number of people who already were homeless before the coronavirus hit. For example, the United States, over half a million people very easily homeless, at least counting, you know, conservatively. Um, but um, the crisis threatens to make the uh, homelessness situation far worse. If anything, it could push it into a catastrophic territory, especially as 
the various patchwork eviction bans that were adopted at the local levels in the, in the United States come to an end and many people become homeless or they're pushed out of their homes for other reasons or they lose their incomes and the supports, the, the support in the form of the additional payments under the CARES Act actually comes to an end and there is no further support system. Uh, the economic uh, uh, impact of that could push a lot more people into homelessness uh, and the number of people as they are pushed into homelessness could sort of tip over into a crisis, the likes of which we have not seen. So we certainly anticipate that. And it's not only the United States. In most countries in the United, in around the world, same story. Many patchwork temporary bans were put in place, but they all came to an end or have come to an end. So the question is that, well, the virus shows no sign of slowing down and countries are scrambling to figure out what to do. But this is one side of the story. The other side of the story that's coming out in the report is also that the issue is not all hopeless. In fact, uh, many governments have adopted temporary measures against homelessness, and some have been actually quite successful. Britain, for example, has radically reduced the number of what they call rough sleepers in Britain. Uh, in a, in a way that has not happened since the 1960s. Um, and this, and I would say many, there are many local government measures that have been taken in the United States as well, you know, uh, some better than others. Uh, for example, dealing with the question of encampments, you find that, you know, local governments like Oakland have done better than certain other local governments. Um, which have actually gone on to break up encampments, for example. Uh, so these kinds of issues have uh, also reminded us that it is still possible, even in the middle of a pandemic, to respond positively, to tackle the problem of homelessness. And many governments seem to be able to do uh, quite a bit under these circumstances. So we should hold governments to a higher standard and push for better results from governments uh, to remind them of their obligations under international law, uh, which involves protecting the right to adequate housing. Um, so the question uh, for me, um, you know, um, for me as a mandate holder in the UN, uh, perhaps I can say a few words about what that actually means and then uh, how that connects with kind of the grassroots mobilizations that uh, like yours that we are seeing around the world. Uh, so of course, you know, uh, as you, uh, most of you probably have seen from the description of the mandate, UN rapporteurs are independent experts who are appointed by states in order to uh, um, uh, provide uh, leadership on particular issues for a certain number of years. Uh, they're basically, uh, individuals who do not represent their governments. They uh, are not paid by the United Nations either. Uh, they are simply people who are appointed in the individual capacity. And uh, part of their job involves reporting on uh, uh, matters of concern in their areas of uh, specialization. If it is housing or freedom of expression or right to food or many of those issues. Uh, involves, it involves reporting to the UN General Assembly as well as to the UN Human Rights Council. It also involves, of course, interacting with states continuously, both on complaints that we receive on a day-to-day -day basis. Evictions, for example, have been, every day eviction complaints have been flooding into my, into my you know, um, agenda since I took over in, in May from around the world. Uh, so you have to decide how to deal with them, you know, involves very often very formal engagements with governments uh, and other times more informal engagements. And um, uh, so there is both a formal as well as an informal sort of side to this mandate. And particularly, I would say, uh, I mean, both are important for grassroots movements and civil society organizations. Uh, formal engagements, for example, could include uh, you know, uh, registering complaints about ongoing violations of housing rights, uh, evictions, for example, or uh, 
homelessness or other issues. Uh, they could also involve formal contributions to UN processes, like for example, the contributions that fed into my report, for example, or contributions that also feed into other UN processes. Uh, the states at the UN, which involve the United States typically, but um, currently the US is not a member of the UN Human Rights Council because it withdrew from the UN Human Rights Council in 2018. Uh, but uh, there is a peer review mechanism at the UN Human Rights Council where countries kind of every five years check each other's records to see how they are doing. And it's a very formal, very thorough process of review. And civil society organizations and grassroots groups play a huge role in holding the feet of the governments to the fire. When governments come there and say, hey, you know, we are doing great. You know, last five years, there were no issues at all. The civil society organization will come up and say, what are you talking about? You know, we've got clear evidence that things are actually not as rosy as you say they are. So um, this is a very important moment of truth telling and accountability. Because for many governments, this is really the only moment when they face any form of accountability. Because when they go back home to their own national capitals, they really have no accountability. They usually, many of them are repressive governments that have eliminated their opposition. So nobody's there to question them within their own country. There is no independent media. There is nothing really, except at the global level, when at least for a brief period, there is some truth telling. So these moments continue to be terribly important, the formal moments. But the informal moments, I think, are equally important. The informal moments include moments like this, for example, events in which you interact with UN rapporteurs and mechanisms. And I'm not the only one, you know, there are other people who you could potentially interact with in the UN uh, as well. And those moments are uh, very important, uh, but also in other informal ways of interacting with the UN involves the two-way process of the UN relying on you. For example, I'm relying on reporting from groups like yours to make my recommendations to states in my report, but it could be the other way around as well. You rely on the UN reports to make your advocacy or your strategies to craft them to sort of align them with, uh, you know, international legal and international human rights, you know, uh, goals. Um, network building is a huge part of this, uh, 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 this uh, informal interaction, which I think in some ways is uh, more important than anything else. And that's kind of where I can conclude. Um, especially uh, because movement building uh, and network building, uh, and I see law at the margins, of course, is very much a believer in uh, the strategies of movement lawyering. Uh, movement lawyering, of course, involves, uh, you know, uh, movement, you know, moments like these, networks like these to insert, you know, people from different levels, including at the UN, into uh, multi-level movements that can actually mobilize successfully for goals that seem out of reach all the time, like advocating for the right to adequate housing. So um, I, I guess I, I just stop there and, uh, you know, may I'm happy to interact, but thank you for inviting me and um, best of luck with all of your challenges. We are living at a very challenging moment, but I also see a tremendous amount of grassroots innovation happening. And uh, I see a lot of changes, which we never thought possible in the housing area happening. Rent control is back in action, in back in conversation, uh, which it has not been again for decades. Uh, um, as I said, problems like homelessness have been tackled, although temporarily, in countries like the UK in a way that was not possible uh, to imagine even a few years ago. So the big question is how do we build on the current moment on the successes that we do see and uh, you know, go forward in a way that actually uh, substantially entrench the right to adequate housing as a human right. So let me express my solidarity with all of you in your struggles and uh, um, 
Do you have a time for just one question? We had a couple questions in the chat of course, here. No, I'm more than okay, happy. great. So one thing in the group um, chats and, and also in this side chat that we've been talking a lot about is that often the policies don't reflect the needs and concerns of people who are homeless or unhoused. Um, and often we do um, uh, have issues getting the government to listen uh, more to the, the people who are actually experiencing these things. So how, you know, um, you're working with the UN, how do we transfer more power at the government level to people in those communities? And is there a better way um, to focus on local, state, and federal government or, um, or, or how they interact with, with those communities? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I, I would say first thing is run for elections and, you know, be the local government yourself. Capture power and then you're going to change things. Uh, and it is happening in many parts of the U.S. I see that. And some of my former students have run for elections at the local level. One is running for, you know, a councilwoman, for example, in L.A. Uh, I mean, this is a an unalterable reality. To change things, you have to capture power. But on the other hand, power, this is only one form of power, the electoral power, you know, or formal political power. But there is a broader question of uh, the power of discourse and the power of expertise that governments rely on in order to sanction their own, uh, uh, their, their own policies, for example. Uh, how do we change that? How do we challenge that? There I would strongly urge you to engage with uh, UN mechanisms uh, and with other expert bodies, particularly with my mandate. You know, uh, if on particular policy changes, you have uh, a coordinated struggle going on to advocate for specific changes, engage with my office and maybe I can formally or informally, you know, put pressure on governments, you know, uh, to, so the pressure could come from both directions, coming from below from, from movements such as yours and supplemented by or assisted by some whatever pressure I can or others can bring from the, from the top. So that is uh, another uh, thing I would say. Uh, the other, uh, the last thing I would say with regard to local governments is that it's very important to build allies, you know, within local governments, one or two even, when, even when it seems like you know, the overall system is against, there is always somebody inside, you know, who is willing to listen and is more open than others. And I found that often changes happen incrementally, you know, one, one step at a time or two steps forward, one step backward, rather than going straight from point A to from zero to 100 in, 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 in one push. Um, but definitely my advice would be to engage more with uh, my mandate and much of the information about how to do that is very easily discoverable online, but basically it's just uh, an email address, srhousing at oschr.org, and you could just email it. And I have staff monitoring emails continuously, and they can also be available for conversation and more than happy to you know, engage directly as well. well. Great, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, can you, uh, there's often sort of this uh, arbitrary line that we draw between people who um, are homeless and people who are housed. Um, can you talk about sort of the fluidity of that? Um, and um, of course, uh, this question says the, the end of homelessness is a home, but what does it mean to have an adequate home? Yeah. Right, right, exactly. Uh, it's a great question. Um, uh, the uh, it's a, it's a it's a very important question, and in, uh, usually in international human rights terms, the more conventional answer or normal answer is to say, an adequate home is one that is decent enough for normal living. Um, that is, it's you you think of it more as a minimum requirement, a floor. This is the least that you should have. Uh, that involves, for example, the building quality, the space for individuals, the physical dimensions of the house, but also the question of uh, affordability, uh, the question of uh, cultural adequacy. I mean, there are different elements of the right to housing. There are seven elements of the right to housing that are um, described and, and analyzed in international human rights law. 
Um, and much of them try to capture that. Uh, but having said that, the question of, uh, you know, what a home is on a continuum uh, is a very important question. And in the United States, I would say this has starkly come up in the case of encampments, which I referred to briefly in my discussion. Some local governments during the pandemic actually, unfortunately, ignored CDC guidelines on encampments and decided to, you know, disband them. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, thus increasing the risks of uh, transmission of the virus much more among both the uh, people living in the encampments as well as those in the wider community. Uh, but other city governments have not done that. For example, Oakland did not do that. Uh, Chico did not do that. So there are many governments that did not do that. Um, but is an encampment, for example, uh, a safe and adequate housing? Well, according to the standards of normal housing, an encampment is not quite adequate yet. Uh, but to disband the encampment, to treat it as though it is not a home or a house at all, uh, depends on whether alternatives are available. Uh, if all that people have, have is uh, at any given moment an encampment, then taking a forcible action to disband an encampment is a violation of international human rights law. Uh, very similar to, for example, the debates we see in uh, developing countries where we have long, vast so-called slums or informal settlements. The homes that they live in are not quite safe or adequate, as we all know. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, to treat those dwellings as though they have no meaning and to readily engage in evicting them as though they have no right to be living there in the first place is also a terrible uh, violation of international law. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to pass it over to Sean Tolley. Thank you again for um, coming today and for taking a couple extra questions. It's really helpful to hear from you. Um, really appreciate you coming. Um, I think there's Sean Tolley. <laughs> yeah, um, just I also and in the spirit of the um, rapporteur asking folks to engage directly, uh, I want to give folks, I know we have a lot of like organizers here. Does anyone have um, direct questions um, before I kind of wind down and close our day? It's been a phenomenal day. Um, I, I, I'm just really just moved by it, but I want to just make sure that folks have other questions. Um, I do think that uh, we will take you up on the offer to engage with you. Um, I think that from today we, um, oh, Reggie, do you want to? Yeah, I wanted to, I Maybe wanted to ask. yourself and then, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask this, this one question because I, I heard, I heard uh, Mr. Rap Rappergold talk about uh, Article 25, which talks about housing. But I wanted to kind of ask him about Article 17, which talks about no nation should arbitrarily deprive one of property. And what does that mean in terms of actually having that in writing? You know what I'm saying? Like, what does that mean? And how should we be using that? Right. That will be our last one. And then we'll, yeah, great. Okay. Thank you, uh, Reggie, for that question. Uh, now, uh, I just want to say that the right to property, of course, is mentioned as one of the rights in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, but it, conventionally in international law, right to property is a much more debated or controversial right. Many countries don't accept it as a human right. Uh, they may accept it as a legal right which is a distinction, but not as a fundamental right of humans. Um, and uh, that's the reason you find that while Article 17 exists in the UDHR, if you actually look forward to the le more legally binding international legal agreements, you know that Universal Declaration of Human Rights itself is not legally binding. It's technically a General Assembly resolution which was adopted by countries by consensus with some abstentions. And 
over time, countries have come to refer to it. Many people around the world have come to know about it, but it's not a legally binding document. To be legally binding, uh, typically in international law, you have to have something which is a treaty or a, an international legal agreement. Uh, and there is an international legal agreement that does confirm housing as human right. Article 11 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. There were two legal agreements that built on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was passed in 1948. And these two international treaties were adopted in 1966, 67. Um, and the United States has ratified or legally enforced one of them, which is the first one, which deals with issues like freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, religion, and so on. It's uh, called the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. But the US has not so far agreed to uh, enforce the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which has all the rights like housing and uh, right to social security and food, the issues that matter for the most marginalized or mentioned there. Article 11 of, the, of that convention actually uh, legally protects the right to housing, but there is no protection in that convention or in any other convention for the right to property. So my straight answer to you on the question of Article 17 is that Article 17 is, uh, is one of those areas of international human rights law where there isn't complete legal agreement and Typically in housing rights advocacy, we like to keep the question of property rights separate from housing rights, mm -hmm. um, not to confuse the two because at property advocacy, unfortunately can also be hijacked and be deployed for very regressive ends by, you know, um, by many around the world. And uh, one reason why it has turned out to be more controversial over the years. I hope that answers your question, or unless I misunderstood the purpose of what do we do with Article 17 as it's currently written? If, uh, did I answer that question? I think we might sort of hold that, uh, we'll connect you. I think some of the issue, um, just as an interest to sort of wind down, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, Reggie, and um, I, I think some of the strategies, um, you know, Professor, were about reclaiming property. Um, that's the work that um, I, you know, uh, need to be in Oakland. I mean, I think one of the reasons why uh, the city wasn't successful in Oakland, you know, for my two cents, is because there was this massive grassroots mobilization and reclaiming. Um, the property and space. And I, I believe the same thing happened in New York and other localities. So um, there is this sort of separating it isn't necessarily going to be 